Elena Manfredini is the principal and owner of Atelier Manfredini. The firm has completed art and architectural projects in the US, Europe, and Asia. Notable among the firm's projects are the Pavilion for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, Bianca Three Stories Boat in Japan, and a series of interior design renovations in Los Angeles. Elena was awarded the Graham Award for Architecture, the Acadia Innovative Research Award of Excellence, the AIA Los Angeles Educator of the Year, a grant from the United States Artists in the category of Architecture and Design, and a City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs Visual Artist Fellowship. Elena has been a visiting professor at the University of California, Berkeley, Cornell University, University of Pennsylvania, and Saika University in Kyoto, Japan. She currently teaches at SciArc and has been the coordinator of the graduate th thesis program before shifting gears as the newly appointed graduate chair. How do you play with an architectural puzzle? You need to have the pieces and know what they are. For example, a cube that sits flat is a six-sided solid. But call it a building, and it becomes four elevations or facades, one floor or ground, one roof or ceiling. But what do you call a wall that reflects the ground? A ground that projects the ceiling, and facades that mirror their neighbors. Atelier Manfredini might know. Elena, thank you for making the time to sit down with me today. I know that your day is completely packed. Thank you. <laughs> what do you consider was your first architectural project? Mm, probably a pavilion. I don't think it's an architectural project per se, but it was the most important project for me that I've started with in 2006. It was for um, the Biennale in Beijing. Um, they asked six architects to represent six different continents. So I was representing the United States. And um, in many ways, it was the first time um, I built something ground up. Um, even it was um, a temporary project, um, it was actually an interesting one because I could explore in full scale, at a building scale, uh, what I wanted to do. Probably, um, although temporary, um, the project started a sort of exploration of fabrication and formalism that, in patterns, that then became a way of thinking in my practice. You come from an engineering background. Has that allowed you to liberate yourself more, or has it been more of a constraint? I, I tend to say many times that I'm an architect because I'm an engineer, meaning that I came to the United States when I was 23, and I already had a full uh, training as an engineer. And that, in many ways, helps me every day in the professional life. So when it comes to construction, when it comes to building, when it comes to organizing, I feel like what I had in terms of education, trained me to be an architect. Whereas what the um, United States really gave me was more of uh, a design um, um, direction, I think, that then became very important for me as an architect. But I think engineering is a solid base for many other things. And I don't think it was ever um, something that held me back. Actually, I think the kind of um, precision uh, in many ways informed a lot of the research on um, patterns and textures and surfaces and materials that uh, we are working on in the office. Do you view your work as permanent or temporary? Is there a timeless effect or is there an intense duration? I, I, I think by nature the projects I do are tend more to the temporary than the um, permanent. I um, see this as being partially um, an evolution of the practice that goes from being a small practice to a larger practice. So I think that's a natural part of things. Um, I do think that the experience of the architectural um, object is to me very important. So actually that experience has been an experience that is uh, a temporary one and a precise one is very dear to me. So in many ways you could imagine this um, as being temporary architecture, even if it's um, permanent. We're doing many projects now in the office that are going to be there for at least 25 years. That's what the kind of maintenance we have to give uh, to clients. And even though they are permanent at every effect, I think they want to be um, a special experience when people enter the building. So I think no matter what, there is always a sense of um, event um, and sort of a creation of a personal space in a public building is what we are really working on.
you talk about the political project, which can be a controversial subject, what is it meant by that? Is there an underlying agenda at work without us knowing? Or is it something we become active participants in? Or do we have to understand what we're seeing? I, I think the political project is actually uh, very embedded in what I do and what we do in the office in general. Um, I think many projects could be described as political and it's a very difficult thing to, to, to define and you could do it in many different ways. But particularly in, in the practice and in the art project that we're doing, um, we're trying to find, um, again, a personal space in a public building, which I think is what um, art does at its best and political projects do at its best. In many ways, I don't think the art is to be understood, but it's definitely to be lived. There is an intellectual engagement and a sensorial engagement, and both are simultaneous in the project. Um, I do um, care about audience, and not in terms of um, a politically correct understanding of audience, but more as part of, a crucial part of the fruition of art in general. Uh, you could not imagine art existing without the audience. I think it's, there's a gap, a delta, between um, the art project and the audience, and the audience really complete that. And it cannot be complete without it. That's a really interesting point to make as it takes me right to the next question. There's a struggle in the discipline to either associate or disassociate art from architecture. But you seem comfortable weaving both. How do you look at those two aspects? I, I think architecture is an art. Um, and in, in many ways, you could imagine, I know it's, it's my cell phone, I'm sorry. Um, you could imagine um, that art is a bigger umbrella and architecture is one of the arts. I don't imagine that architecture could and shouldn't be part of humanistic uh, disciplines um, and should not just be simply um, a delivery of a service to a client. I think there, is, there are such, such companies that do that. Uh, there are also certain schools that do that. They train um, students towards a service industry, probably uh, SIARC, I think without probably, SIARC is not one of those. Um, and it understands um, the relationship between the two being a crucial one, an important one. Um, and understanding that architecture can or might be able to uh, change people's life. I think is a very important part of what we do as architects and artists in general. Talking about the communication of the work, you state that the abstract leads to more difficulty of communication. Why is that and what are you trying to communicate? I, I think you, um, abstraction is an important part of architecture, I think is a crucial part of art and architecture in general, is where um, things are not spelled out, there's certain ambiguity, and therefore there is an ambiguity of interpretation, which makes them quite timeless in many ways. Um, I think abstraction is, in many ways, a geometrical device, um, things that we design and then don't necessarily are able to be associated to something existing. So it's an um, intellectual relationship and definitely an ambiguous one. I think uh, we have been through a moment where um, the tension between um, abstraction and figuration has been quite um, fruitful. Figuration meaning literal uh, figures that we can actually associate um, with other concepts of things. And that relationship is becoming and has become interesting in general in architecture, but also in my practice. I think we've done a lot of work in terms of um, what is the role of figures, literal figures in architecture and how can then trigger different relationships with the audience. Most of the work really comes from an association that when you understand exactly what you're in front, then you don't try to understand it and you engage it with it on a sensorial level. And so that part of the work we've been doing with scanning with literal objects has been really about that establishment of relationship with the audience. Many of the literal image work uses nature as a subject. How important is the subject you use, and what role does it play? I think when I started using nature, it was more of an exercise of, um, of technique. Uh, 
and nature was an easy subject. And it's maybe what I would call the still nature exercise, which happens in painting. So it's not really about the flowers, the apples, the bananas. It's not about the object, the subject of the depiction. It's about how you depict it. And so it becomes a benchmark. The object, the subject of the depiction becomes simply a benchmark. And every artist uses the same subject because they want to find new techniques. And so it's not about what you depict, but how you depict it that becomes important in the still nature. It's the portrait, example of the portrait as well. It's not about the figure of the face or the self-portrait. It's about the exercise of painting this human subject in a different way. So I use nature as a still nature exercise, the first um, and basic and in many ways empty of meaning um, subject that could be used and the exercise was mainly about uh, techniques and what certain techniques of scanning, certain techniques of literality and certain material um, finishes could then play a different role in architecture. If we could go back to the work you've done with the digital brush strokes, the digitally made analog paintings that are then reapplied to the surface, how do you view it in relationship to historic precedents such as the fresco? I, I definitely look at those as being interesting uh, precedents of the relationship between painting and architecture. So definitely I looked at large pictures. They could have been the classical fresco or much larger surfaces being painted like the Tintoretto um, paintings for San Rocco. I, I really looked at the relationship between the two and I th because um, I think part of the interest of the office was really advancing the, um, the painterly effects in architecture and seeing how certain um, techniques and qualities could be achieved and how they could change our perception of what architectural surfaces could be. So they're definitely very strong in my mind, this uh, classical reference of painting, for sure. What's the, what's the difference in the effect of a painterly effect versus a graphic effect? Um, I think they could both be doing a lot of work. I don't necessarily see them as being a different ground. They both work with uh, chromatics, size, effect of depiction. So I, I, I see them as maybe different styles rather than uh, different point of departures. One of the major um, attempts, I think, of the work is to take the painterly out to, outside of the understanding of being a tableau, meaning a painting onto uh, a wall, and actually make them become the wall itself. And so the idea is that size is not... Build, painting, big painting, is not about being grandiose or it's not a pompous act or monumental act. It's actually about the relationship with the audience. The larger the painting, then the more immersive the audience becomes with it. And so the idea was really to take away the idea of the painting from being a, a placement of a picture on a wall and become an environment itself. Talking and frescoes do that quite, quite, a, quite a lot. Talking about the performance, <clears throat> At what point does the image go from representation to performative, performative rather than ornamental? Could we view some of your surface treatments as ornamental? I think they perform um, intellectually, accessorially, and especially in terms of materiality. They don't perform in the sense of being engineering, structurally um, self-sustained. Or in certain cases, yes. I mean, in certain parts of the projects, yes, we're doing a glazing facade, and then the painting is activated by, uh, yes, the graphic element that we printed, but also the sun going through it. It's also a glazing element as mullions is acting as a facade, so it's actually keeping uh, the weather out. So they do end up performing because they are architectural elements, but probably the performance we're more interested in the office is more of an um, effect performance. So how, for instance, the painting and the sun react or how a mirroring effect can um, make the audience belong to a fantasy. When you see yourself mirrored inside an image, then how do you imagine, how do you then create this personal space, this fantasy space within that experience? That's probably the kind of ex performance we're looking into the most.
what's the effect of choosing the graphics versus choosing the material? And does one come before the other? Mm, probably the material, um, I think they come, they sort of come together, I think. Uh, there is an understanding that the graphic um, will play with the material in terms of transparency, reflection, thickness, um, mm. and we understand transparency of the graphic accordingly to what ma the material will be. So they are a hand-in-hand -hand, uh, project somehow. You're interested in the context and space that surrounds the area you're working in. Do you view yourself as a contextual architect? I think architecture has been able to develop a very different way of understanding contextualism in the past 20 years. Context is not anymore about um, similarities or geographical proximity, which I think is the way in which we understand context. You have a building next to another building. What if the windows are the same? What if the color is the same? That is the context as we understand it, or we understand it traditionally. I think we have, look, we have been looking at context in a very different ways. I think somehow all these relaxed, more fluid shapes have a different relationship to the urban um, grid, for instance. The fact that we don't anymore orient necessarily facades with the, 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 the urban grid, but they actually have a different relationship in a much larger urban radius, I think opens up completely different um, relationships. The fact that certain fluid shapes connect to each other in different parts of the globe because of their aesthetic, because of their iconic quality, because of what they represent globally in the economic globalism of our society, I think that opens up again a completely different way of connecting things and it's not just about proximity and self-similarity. So I think in general the contextual um, has been the ground of really important work from architecture. I would imagine that for the past 20 years, if I, the form has been one and context has been the second one people have been really working on, whether or not with awareness, because also the stylization problem becomes a contextual project. Um, generally speaking, I see context more as uh, users than necessarily self-similarity. Um, I see context as a political um, reaction and or enabling of a certain situations. So I see context much more of an intellectual and social level than uh, necessarily a geographical or uh, self-similarity problem. Well, it's interesting that you bring up two points of context and form. And in a way, your firm doesn't really deal with new forms or the research new forms, digital forms, Instead, it seems you're more interested in what you apply to the space or how you recreate the space completely separate from a formal aspect. I think it's, it's, it's part of a progression. I think uh, uh, if you would look at the work I've done uh, 15 years ago, probably much, was much more formal than today. And I think if, if at some point form was really uh, important, as um, a level of discussion, I think somehow, as of now, form and, and finish are much more complementary of each other. I think we went through a moment in the digital architecture where all the things that architects knew how to do got erased because the digital brought to the table new formal exploration and everybody kind of went directly to the geometry. I think now we're going back to understanding also that beyond geometry there are also other level of refinement that architects really are master in and they are bringing them into the project. So I think it's a generational shift more than my practice. What opportunities does scanning bring to this discussion that modeling doesn't? I think I started scanning um, out of the desire to bring some freshness in the projects. I started I think six years ago and it was a moment where everything in my office was modeled or scripted and had a sense of order and self-similarity to it. It missed some analog quality that I um, thought was important to have, both in terms of immediacy of uh, the effect, uh, ability to bring in materiality, and ability to bring in also analog and dirtiness in the projects, which was very difficult to obtain actually through chronicles of um, scripting that would really become at the end quite quite quickly 
understandable in terms of what they can give you. You still recognize a sense of order in all of them. So the idea of scanning came from the desire to bring in different uh, qualities in the work. Um, was a quite specific move I made. And also came from the understanding that literal and photorealism became at that point important to talk about. And formalism, in terms of literal formalism, became important to talk about. Probably the work I've done um, in the past six years will now shift into something else. I think has been explored to the level of um, of space enough to go away from just a small object. I mean, we already have done a few projects um, at larger scale with these experimentations, and the office is moving towards other other avenue as of now. But it was very useful, I thought, and it does become, I think, nowadays a way of working. If um, computers really enable that, at the end of the day, six years ago, it was very hard to get. Uh, and to handle certain mesh, certain level of complexity, level of texture. I think now it's, um, the computers just allow you to do it and it becomes a way of working, it becomes a way of visualizing. I mean, everywhere in the internet now, it's everything is scanned somehow. And I think it creates an immediate thing with geometry and texturality that becomes interesting to work with. What do you view the role of drawings in architecture today? Does a drawing have to contain lines? Can an image be a drawing? Absolutely, I think one of the major attraction to the scanning was for me that it became a new drawing. It's really a three-dimensional drawing that contains geometry and texture. I think I, I would imagine all of those things to be part of the drawing. So I don't think the drawing is necessarily points of lines or being b-dimensional. It's actually a set of an array of, of techniques and tools that open up a much wider palette of opportunities. I would imagine a 3D scan being a drawing. Um, lines are not necessarily the only device. I think it's how we are trained as architects or how we were trained as architects. I don't think you guys are any more trained in the same way and we have a completely different approach to drawings. I think drawings are fully three-dimensional in this generation and they should be. They, they should be um, in sync with the techniques and the tools that the generation need to visualize their ideas. Repetitive geometry is a feature that is prominent in your built work. What performative aspect do these geometries have? I think they, um, they come from an overall sense of order <laughs> that I have ingrained uh, in me and a, a sense of elegance probably that they bring to the table. Also, I think I'd also try to disrupt that ordering system with either scanning techniques or drawing techniques, overlapping techniques, uh, coloration. So I think it, it, it's a mix of, of layers. I think also comes from the desire to build and the desire to have a certain level of um, control in the process of building and what it takes to use building construction materials into the reality of three-dimensionality. I, I think that's part of a necessity um, of an office also to um, engage with the geometry in a way that can be um, translating from drawings to physicality. You deal a lot with the optical, optically driven surface. Glass becomes a semi-parti with the application of the film, and the wall becomes semi-mirroring, allowing it to move away from its solid state. What new possibilities do these open up? I, I think we are definitely facing a moment where finish in architecture is much more interesting than usual. Usually. Architects have been trained to think that there is a true nature to materials and the true nature has to be respected. And I think as of now, materials have a much wider spectrum of possibilities. And something I call finish simply because it's not simply the finish of the material, it's something that you apply. You apply paint, you apply toolpath, you apply coating, you apply printing, and suddenly uh, the material itself adds has a completely different nature. That is not the true nature, it's actually a synthetic nature. And I think synthetic nature is actually um, interesting because it displaces the viewer expectations of architecture. So somehow there is no more this binary relationship between material and what I expect from it. Actually that is disrupted and all the time it's disrupted, I think the audience has to recreate a set of expectations. Anytime you break the link between expectation of the audience and the object you're looking at, then suddenly you advance 
the field. So I think that's why Finnish to me are quite important. I, I always try to work with them. It's interesting with a lot of architects that seem to move away from the wall, the column, all the other traditional elements in architecture, but you seem not to be so afraid of keeping them around in the work. How do you feel about the idea of moving on from the tra traditional elements of architecture versus the completely new approach? I, I don't view a formal solution of the column as necessarily a, the only source of novelty. I don't think formal novelty is the only kind of novelty. I would go and imagine that um, there is less novelty in high formalism than in materials, for instance, in my opinion, as of now. Um, there is uh, more depth in certain qualities of surface than necessarily overall um, shapely virtuosity. So I'm not completely sure that novelty and form are necessarily uh, always combined. It can be. Um, it doesn't have to be the case. Um, probably also it's, it's an issue of familiarity, how much of displacement you want to obtain in the architectural experience. And um, in many cases, we don't have um, the amount of freedom that it requires probably to operate on both at the same time. And between the two, I prefer to work on the experience, in the aesthetic experience rather than in the geometrical manipulation. It's interesting when you talk about the experience, you talk a lot now about the fictional instead of the narrative. Could you maybe explain this idea of the immersion moving away from Bernard Schumann's version of the Manhattan transcript to the narrative versus your fictional world that you've created? I, I mean, I think they're both interesting actually, and I think they're both part of what architects do. I mean, they create, they're storytellers at the end. I mean, we imagine architects as people that build buildings. Actually, we don't build buildings. We build memories, device for buildings. We draw them, we represent them, we construct argument for them. And therefore, I think the construction of the argument is really the battlefield of architecture. And however, it's more being a lawyer, I imagine this, a creative lawyer probably, but I'm not imagining architects as being the person that builds a building. Architects are the people that construct models, drawings, arguments, and narratives to have the support to build a building. So that's a narrative and um, is an important one. Either it's a narrative of the architect talking to a client, or it's a narrative of architecture operating on, um, on the space. Those are the things that actually architecture does at best. Um, probably it's more of a generational issue, this shift between Bernard Schumann and the contemporary architectural um, interest. Um, so the narrative, it's not a device of creation. So it's not the creative device for the architect, but it's probably more the, um, the factual um, consequences of architecture. It is a very different moment of where, where narrative is used. Is it used as a device for the architect to create, or is it used um, through the life of the architectural object and how then there is an interaction with it? There are two very different moments. And I think it's a generational shift. It's not only my project. I think it's a collective project in many ways. Picking on the generational shift a little bit more, Peter Eisenman has stated that there are no more corners after Derrida. I state that there is only multiple corners after Atelier and Ferdini. <laughs> Can you elaborate on your approach to the corner and the pinched corner that show up in your work? I think maybe you're referring to the Mocha. I mean, which project are you referring to the most? Mocha and also your product design projects where the corners get pinched? Um, I think, generally speaking, I have an obsession with seams and patterns. A pattern seen in two ways. Uh, either they are actually ordering system for fenestration, or they're actually with the way in which you unfold um, shapes and bring them back together. So I don't see the corner only as being 
a moment where two planes uh, come together is actually where two pieces of fabric, two pieces of sheets of paper come together. So it's more about the seaming around uh, the geometry rather than uh, the definition of the geometry through their bullion. So I think it's a different approach in terms of materials, understanding that geometry and material come together and the corner is not uh, a secondary device uh, from the material, meaning that geometry comes first and, 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 and material comes second. If they come at the same time, actually, I would call that joint a seam, not a corner. And that is when I think many things can happen in terms of novelty. And also maybe picking on the geometry you use, your edge sometimes shows up as a fringed edge or a shattered edge. Maybe, could you maybe talk about the idea of not allowing the pure geometry to show up in the book? It's a difficult and very hard task, actually, to make geometry not appear. I realize that in reality, this is the hardest thing that architects want to do, is make things light, look light, or transparent, or disappearing, or fragile. Uh, actually, the reality of physicality is something you uh, really have to deal with, thickness and the presence. So I think it's, it's um, a desire that many architects have. I mean, if you really look through it, the idea that something would not look as heavy as it is, would not look as contained as it is, the idea that there is a certain level of infinity in the work, some kind of disappearance, some kind of optical effect. The reality is, is that's not an easy task to do because materials usually have a pretty good presence in reality and it's a hard thing to balance. And that probably that balance is what, in my opinion, creates incredible architecture. I mean, Sana uh, is a master of that creation of of blurred edges and she does it with quite solid materials and solid shapes. It takes really um, an incredibly um, sophisticated eyes to get there. Could you maybe also elaborate on the idea of scale in your work? Mm -hmm. Are these images scalable? Are your graphics scalable? Or once it reaches a certain scale, is there a new way of approaching the problem? I think there is a scale um, limitation in everything. There are, it depend, it's, it's not true that anything can be scaled. A drawing has to obtain um, different thicknesses, different division in modules, um, different tectonics according to how you're using it. So the seamless is impossible uh, in architecture. I mean, there is the idea of wholeness that unfortunately we need to deal with. Tectonic is not as interesting, I think, as a project but it's a necessity uh, in, our, um, in our profession. And so every scale has its own um, demands. And sometimes the drawing can go from being a stool in my practice and it's just self-sustained and it doesn't need a structure, it's just about perforation and folding and everything stands up. When you go to the project of a pavilion, then you can fold many more times and still stands up. Then there is a point where if it goes to a facade, then suddenly it needs to be thick enough to have structure and you have to have modular system behind it and, and sustain itself. So I think in any project you do, whether or not there's graphic involved, the drawing needs to gain different thicknesses accordingly to what, um, to what the scale of the application is. I do tend to find the thinnest and most delicate possible um, materials for things and use folds and geometries to somehow maintain the structure as being integral to the surface itself to make the surface do more work than having that to be sustained by structure. But generally speaking, I think um, there is a scale definition to any materials. I want to ask you about like, with the thickness the idea of the section, the idea of developing projects through sections. But it seems with your projects, they're so material-based, and the material has such a large effect on the work, that can the drawings actually develop the work, or how does the project develop? I think it depends how you define the drawings. I think that two paths um, for fabrication of sheets are drawings, and the same drawing is what creates uh, maybe the decoration of you know, what, what you call a motif, but then from the motif becomes actually a way to take away materials and make it lighter, or it becomes a way to score uh, a sheet and bend it and so to make it structural. So somewhat I think drawings are to me a much wider 
um, spec have a much wider spectrum of um, of applications. I mean, some architects just think of drawings as being um, plans and sections, or to be the artistic drawing. I think to me, even construction documents, but fabrication shops, toolpath, are interesting drawings, and they are part of the potentials of it. So, somewhat, I don't think a project. Uh, should be coming only from one specific drawing, so the section, but it, sh it, it happens to be that the drawing has different manifestation into a project. Let's end on asking you, what's next for Atelier and um, Well, right now in the office, we're quite busy actually, it's, it's good, it's a good moment, I think the economy is uh, generous with us. Uh, we are <laughs> working on a ground up um, in Los Angeles and um, a couple of hotels, um, projects, uh, interior facades. So we are moving uh, the work into more permanent states, uh, which I quite think is an important experience for the office. Um, and probably um, there's a stronger, again, a stronger interest in geometry now in the office. Uh, so it moves, you know, moves back and forth, I think, between graphic and geometry. I think right now it's, it's, it's moving again towards geometry. Elena, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.